the followers of Jesus, just like you and me, didn't get it. They thought they knew what was going on, but they didn't. And Jesus had to spend 40 more days with them after he rose from the dead to teach them again everything he had been teaching them for three years. You and I have the benefit of a lifetime with the word of God and the church, and they didn't have that. They did have three years with Jesus, and then they got 40 odd days more with him before he ascended to heaven. And so I want to share with you this morning from John 20, something that Jesus gave the disciples. And I also want to read to you uh, something that a modern saint wrote about this. But I want to read just a few verses from John 20 first. So if you have your Bibles open to John 20, we're going to start in verse 19. When therefore it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, Sunday, by the way, that's why we worship on Sundays, when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Anybody here ever been afraid? Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Verse 20, and when he had said that, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Don't you find it just a tiny bit weird they weren't rejoicing when he first appeared in the room? A miraculous appearance of God, the glorified Jesus Christ, appears in the room, and they're kind of like, who's that? Until he shows them his hands, and his side. Verse 21. Jesus therefore said to them, Again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And then verse 26. And after eight days again, so the next week, his disciples were inside, and Thomas was with them this time. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, he just appeared in the room, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. There's a, a strange part of Easter that we frequently just ignore, don't get, can't even picture in our minds. So I want to ask you right now to, to do this one exercise with me. Picture in your mind, your heart, your imagination, whatever part of you can possibly do this, picture what peace is. What's it look like? What does peace look like to you? Or what does peace feel like to you? God's perfect peace. Because in this short section of scripture we just read, Jesus said that to the disciples three times. Peace be unto you. In contrast to that, the disciples were afraid. And you and I have a few stresses in our life today. And Jesus is speaking to us after he rose from the grave. Peace be unto you. So before we actually get into the fill-in-the-blank notes that I know you just can't wait to, you're all excited about that, I want to read something to you that kind of gives you an idea of what Jesus did when he rose from the dead. Because when he first created man, Adam and Eve, in the garden, everything was perfect. There was perfect peace. So I'm going to read to you just a short description here of, of that perfection which is what God is doing today after the resurrection with you and I. Adam was created happy, and his happiness could have increased day by day throughout all eternity. Adam lived in the most beautiful paradise, in a garden planted by God. All you gardeners said, amen. amen. Come on now. Gardeners, let's feel the joy here. Okay. Lived in the most beautiful paradise, a garden planted by God himself. 
where he was content with everything. God said it was perfect, didn't he? He was, Adam was healthy as well. He would never have known any kind of sickness. Wouldn't you like to feel that? He was not afraid of anyone or anything. All the animals and birds obeyed him. He could wash his car and never fear a bird dropping something on it. All the animals obeyed him as their king because God made it that way. He felt neither heat nor cold. And although he labored and worked in paradise, yet he worked with pleasure and delight. Is that what you're looking forward to tomorrow when you go to work? He worked with pleasure and delight and did not find toil burdensome or work tiring. His heart and soul were full of knowledge and love of God. Amen. Hallelujah. He was always quiet and happy. He never knew and never saw anything unpleasant, upsetting, painful, or sad. All his desires were pure, right, and in order. Isn't that amazing? His memory, intellect, and all the other faculties of his soul were perfect. And being innocent and pure, he always lived with God and conversed with him. And it doesn't say it in the text here, but face to face, they were together. And God loved him as his favorite son in the earthly sense. In short, Adam was in paradise and paradise was in Adam. Peace was unto Adam. So when Jesus says to his disciples, peace be unto you, peace be with you, that's what Jesus is saying. Is that a little bit different than the normal earthly version of that word? God did something different when Jesus rose from the dead, and the gift he gives to all who follow him is different than anything the world could ever give you. Because when God gives you his peace, it is something from God, not this earth. Amen is right. This is the reason to get excited after the resurrection, folks. God is giving you a miracle here that you've never seen. It's never existed on this planet since Adam sinned until Jesus rose from the dead. He gives this free gift. We call it salvation, but that's not a big enough word, is it? It's this whole new reality of life in Christ that is being a new creation in a new paradise with God forever and ever. Amen. In his, not the world's, his perfect peace. That's a little bit different, isn't it? So, this fullness of peace that God is giving is making us to be holy as in 100% and holy as in sanctified, set apart, perfect without sin in intimate fellowship and love with God, having everything you need to be filled with his joy. Is that the reality of your life at this moment? You have everything you need be filled with his joy? The answer is yes. If you know Jesus, if you have faith in him, you have all the riches of heaven. You've got everything. The same perfection God created to give Adam, he's now given you in Christ. Not this world. This sinful world is still a sinful world. But you have everything now in Christ. God's perfect peace is yours in Christ. And so in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he tells us what? That you are now a new creation. The old creation, Adam destroyed. When he sinned, he planted sin in the DNA of every, not just the DNA of every person, his children, but the, every molecule in all of creation. All of creation is under the curse of sin until God recreates it. And he's making you first. 
You are now a recreation, a new creation in Christ. That's what he says. If you have faith in Jesus. So you're a new creation. And this new reality means that while we get to live here on earth by faith in Jesus Christ, you are now God's child. You are now a royal priest. You are now God's holy ambassador from his kingdom to all the communities of this earth who are not currently in his kingdom. That's what Easter means. That's what the resurrection has done. You are now his child. And you know, you knew that, didn't you? You go, yes, and Jesus, I know I'm a new child. Yes, 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 that's a good idea. But do you wake up every morning delighting in the fact you are his daughter, you are his son? God the Father is your father? Jesus said, I will never leave you heard a story this morning from a dad, I'm not going to name names, but a, a young dad, who woke up this morning with two of his kids in his bed. Actually, one in the bed, one on the floor next to the bed. Because the little kids in the middle of the night decided they wanted to be next to daddy and mommy. Beautiful picture, isn't it? And many of you who are parents, you experience the same thing. Wake up and then, like, what are these kids doing in here? Jesus said, I will be with you always. Do we ever have any reason to fear if God is with us always? If nothing separates us from his love? If we are his child, he's our father. The world can be a messed up place all day long. But God's perfect. His love for us is perfect. Nothing separates us from his love. We're his new creation. When Jesus says, peace be unto you, it's a whole different reality, isn't it? That's how we are to live, consciously. We have a choice to make here. Because the world's always trying to grab our attention. And, and when the world grabs our attention, the peace goes right out the window. Have you noticed that? So we need to focus on the peace of Christ by focusing on Christ. That's the first stunning change that Easter gives us, the resurrection gives us. His perfect peace. And then look at John 20, 22. And when he had said this, peace be unto you, peace be with you, he breathed on them. You need to picture God creating Adam in the garden. Because when God created Adam, he breathed life into him. Adam's life did not come from the dirt. It didn't come from evolving from any other animal. It came from God. And God, in Jesus Christ, breathed onto the disciples to give them new life. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. We are now recipients of the Holy Spirit. Your body now is a temple of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. How are you treating the temple? When I was in Turkey last summer, I saw lots of ancient ruins of temples to fake gods, all the Roman gods and Greek gods and just all the different idols. Lots and lots and lots of ruins, temples everywhere. When you look in the mirror in the morning when you're you know, doing your hair, brushing your teeth, you are looking at a temple that God has created in his image to be his temple where he is now dwelling. God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit now dwell in you. Because God said so, not because you made it so, God did. It's a God thing. So how are you treating the temple? Are you dwelling with Jesus physically, emotionally, spiritually? in your being? Are you consciously being present with him? Because he's consciously being present with you. Or are you letting the world grab your attention? This new reality means that your literal physical body, as weak as you might be, with all the troubles you might have, some people have arthritis, some people have diabetes. I mean, there's all kinds of things that attack our bodies in this sinful world. 
but God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is in you, and He is doing a work in you. He is constantly transforming you into perfection and maturity in Christ. Now, what does this perfection look like? Turn to the book of Galatians. Chapter 5. This is what God is doing in contrast to what the world is doing. Starting in verse 18, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. If you read the first four chapters of Galatians, you see how God gave the law, the, the Old Testament, the Word of God, to lead us to Christ, a tutor. But the law also condemns us under sin because it convicts us of all sin. So it's a tutor and it's a convictor. We're not under law if we're led by the Spirit. Now, the deeds of our flesh, that is, the part of our being that is physical on this planet and led prone to sin, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry. Kind of like the, the newspaper and the evening news all rolled into one, isn't it? Every day in this planet. And more. Idolatry, sorcery. Enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions. Again, watch the evening news. Envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But in contrast to all the ways of the world and all the sins of this world, here is the work of God, the fruit of the Spirit that he is growing in every follower of Christ. Love, God's love, by the way, not just physical affection, God's holy love. Joy, God's joy. Peace, same peace Jesus gave the disciples. Patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there's no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified, there's Easter, they've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. The bottom line is, God is making you his new creation day by day as we cooperate with him. See, there's no such thing as a Christian who prays the sinner's prayer, you know, walks the aisle one time, raises the hand one time, whatever, you know, all the different traditions we have, without following Christ the rest of their life day by day, minute by minute. We cooperate with God in this process. He is doing this work. He's made you his temple. Now, what are you doing? Are you cooperating with this process by being led by the Spirit? And I'm going to make this entirely simple. All it means to be led by the Spirit is to say yes to him in every decision you make and no to your sinful desires. That's what it means to say, I have been crucified with Christ. So, that big honking cross we have on the wall there, that life-size piece of wood that Jesus was nailed to at Calvary, he means us to live this lifestyle every day. So every day, we crucify our sinful desires. And we submit to the Spirit of God, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness, all of those things, right? All the fruit of the Spirit. That's the new creation that we are as we're led by the Spirit. And he grows that fruit so that we show we are his disciples by living this resurrection life and living this new creation of life. We're different than the world, folks. When we follow Jesus with crucified sinful desires, being led by the Spirit, simply say no to your sinful flesh and yes to the Spirit in everything, every decision. That sounds really simple, doesn't it? until you're faced with that temptation. Oh, I can resist anything but 
temptation. Ever said that? That's why every diet fails. It's not a matter of fighting against that extra piece of chocolate cake, right? Or whatever temptation is calling out to you. Because we all have our own favorite sins. Maybe your favorite sin is worry, or maybe your favorite sin is anger. You know, the Baptist's favorite sin is gluttony. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things that we love, right? Some people love gossip. Ooh, let me tell you what I just heard. And they're all sins. And it really doesn't matter what your favorite sin is. Because that's what Jesus paid for on the cross. He died, shed his blood to pay for your sin. And mine. And everybody else's. So we're all sinners in the same boat. Can we just say amen? amen? And there's not a single sinner in Sacramento worse than you or me. Just let that sink in. There's not one sinner in Sacramento worse than you, worse than me. But now we get to live led by the Spirit. Transform life, new creation. And the peace of God comes in. And God himself comes in. And he makes us new. That we experience the perfection that God intended us to all experience when he first made earth. And it was perfect. And he first made the garden. And it was perfect. And he first made Adam and Eve. And they were perfect. And God fellowship with them face to face. This is what God wants for us today. Amen? So... How do you produce this new life? You know, some of you are pretty creative. Some of you are quilters or gardeners. You, you like to create new things. You can sew. You can do art. All that's wonderful, awesome. But how do you produce this new life? John 20, 31. Turn back to John. But these, these words, this New Testament, this gospel, but these have been written that you may believe, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, there's the action, the verb, you may have life in his name. Let's, let's focus on the last part of that sentence first. To be in his name is to be in the and the position, the power, and the authority of Jesus himself. If the governor of, of Judea in Jesus' day gave you his signet ring so you could sign a contract in his name, he's giving his power and his authority, the full authority of his, of his office, to sign a contract in his name. So you just stamp that hot ink on the parchment or whatever the contract was written on, and that would suddenly be a valid contract with the authority of the governor. And Jesus is now giving you that. In his name means to be in Jesus, in his power, in his authority, with him. That's what it means. It's not just a, a nice little tag we add to our prayers. You ever, you ever notice that some people do? They'll pray like for 13 hours and they'll say, in Jesus' name. Like that's some kind of magic incantation. No. We actually say that. And we should be saying that mindfully because we're trying to pray in the will of Jesus himself as Jesus would pray. So if you're praying every day for a new Ferrari, you might not want to say in Jesus' name. That might have more to do with your own desires rather than Jesus' desires because when you add that phrase in his name, it should be what Jesus desires, what Jesus would pray himself. Amen? So we had to have this new life in him. Now, I boil this down as simply as I could. To actually do this action of believing, it means to trust with an exclamation point. Trust with immediacy. Like, you, there's no hesitancy, no hesitancy, no doubt. You don't waver. You don't hold back. You don't, you don't tell Jesus, oh, let me think about it. 
Even Thomas, when he doubted, remember the Apostle Thomas, when Jesus did show up in front of him and said, here, go ahead and stick your hand right here in the holes in my wrists. Go ahead. You want to stick your fingers in my side? You know, with a spear wing? Go ahead. And Thomas didn't even try to touch him. He just fell down and said, my Lord and my God. No more doubt, no more wavering, no more hesitancy. So I, I want to ask you a question, and I don't want you answering me. I want you answering Jesus, okay? This is between you and Jesus. Is there any place in your heart, mind, soul, any part of you that is hesitant, that is holding back? Is Jesus leading you in a way that you're like, mm, I'm not so sure, Lord? Because sometimes following Jesus does mean literally picking up our cross and following him. We don't always want to pick up our crosses. You know the joke about being a living sacrifice. Because we are we're commanded in, in Romans 12 to be a living sacrifice, present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual service of worship. The problem with the living sacrifices is they crawl off the altar. So is there any part of you that is hesitant and immediately trusting Jesus? Because when you're immediately trusting him, when there's an immediacy, there's complete obedience. Because believing, that, that simple word believing, doesn't mean just to agree with intellectually. I think most people in this room would agree intellectually. Yes, Jesus is God. Yes, Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. Yes, Jesus lived a sinless life. Yes, Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead. Yes, yes, yes. Well, guess what? The demons also believe the same thing. And they're not saved. They're not going to experience eternal, intimate fellowship with Jesus. So you have to have this immediacy of trust that works itself out in immediate obedience. Does that make sense? Active trust with certain expectancy. You believe God, you obey God, knowing 100% that no matter what happens here on earth, he's got it. How is your faith daily transforming you into completeness in Christ? That's the question you need to ask between you and Jesus. How is my faith completing me daily, Jesus, in you? Can you look at yourself this year and say, I am definitely more mature in Christ this year than I was last year? That's where the rubber meets the road. If you call yourself a gardener and the only thing growing in your garden is weeds, guess what? You really might not be a gardener. Now, we're laughing about that, but if you call yourself a Christian, what should be growing in your life? Christ-likeness. So, is there more of Christ growing in your life? Is there more of the fruit of the Spirit growing in your life? Are the choices you're making the choices Jesus himself would make if he's literally standing next to you? See, that's, that's one of the problems we have is Jesus isn't standing right next to us. He's actually dwelling in us. And he doesn't you know, put up a stop sign. You know, he doesn't just reach out of your chest with a stop sign before your eyeballs. When we're about to do something that might not please him, he doesn't do that. He actually lets us go and sin instead of stopping us. You know, it would be a whole different matter if Jesus was like some, you know, WWE wrestler, and if he grabbed you, picked you up over his head, and slammed you down on the ground every time you were about to sin, you'd probably be a little more hesitant to sin. But he doesn't do that. Why? He's gentle. He's patient. It is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. God does not use violence to force us to do his will. He wants us to love him. I hope you heard that. All God wants from you is for you to love him. 100%. There's, there's no such thing as a little bit. You can't love God 99%. Because that means that 1% is your idol. So is there anything in your life that you're loving instead of Jesus? 
even that 1%. Do you want that resurrection life? Do you want the perfection and the peace that Jesus rose from the dead to give each of his followers? The first words he said to them was, peace. And I read to you what that meant. The paradise perfection of intimate love with Jesus. It does not exist in this world. It exists in Christ. As we trust him, he makes it real in us and through us. And here's the amazing thing. If that isn't all miraculous enough, as you live this way, you are his blessing to others. And they experience God's peace through you. And it changes them because they are drawn to Jesus. King Jesus, thank you for opening our eyes to see you and to and have a little more understanding of what it means to live in your peace, to live in this new reality with you, this new perfection you have created through rising from the dead. Lord, you have established a new creation, a new kingdom, and you've invited us, you've adopted us, you've brought us in to your new family. Lord, I pray for myself and everyone in this room that you will help us, please, today, tomorrow, and the rest of our lives, the rest of eternity, to walk with you in newness of life, to trust you 100%, to be led by your Spirit in all things, that we would know you and your perfect peace with all the fullness of your joy. Lord, make that real in us. That we would bear your fruit. That we would be your blessing to all other people we ever meet. Lord Jesus, we pray this in your holy name and for your glory. Amen. God bless you.